words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Happy Mother's Day. There is much to celebrate today, along with Mother's Day and some other celebrations and thanksgivings. Today we also celebrate the feast day of my favorite English mystic. She is also the author of the first text written in English by a female that we know of. And according to the great Thomas Merton, she is the greatest English theologian. The greatest English theologian is a woman. Her name is Julian of Norwich. 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 Sue Clark's hometown. I wish you still had a house there so we could go on pilgrimage and stay at your place while visiting her, her anchor hold, her anchorage. So she was a 14th century English anchorite or anchoress, which means that she lived enclosed permanently in a room called an anchor hold or anchorage. Have you visited? They have sort of reconstruction of it. It's a room attached to a church with one window facing the altar and another window facing the world outside. So it would be kind of like converting our sacristy into a small apartment where someone has chosen to spend the rest of her life. And during an extreme illness, she experienced a kind of near-death experience in the form of 16 visions, which she called showings, or revelations of divine love. She wrote about these visions and understood them as revelations from God. And while receiving these divine visions and revelations, Julian was not simply a passive recipient, but rather an engaged participant, praying boldly, continuing to seek God's face, as we said in the Psalms, and asking questions and not holding anything back. And Christ seemed to appreciate this and continued to draw her deeper into his love, encouraging her to pray with all that was within her. In one vision, Christ spoke to her and said, in Middle English, pray interly. Now, the word interly is a Middle English hapax legomenon, which means it is a word that only occurs once in all of the Middle English literature that we have. And to pray interly means to pray inwardly or interiorly with all of the emotions and questions of the inner life. And praying interly also means praying entirely with the whole self, with the body, with the physical life. When Christ said to Julian, pray interly, he was saying, pray entirely, pray wholeheartedly, earnestly, and pray even if you feel nothing. Bring that nothingness to me in prayer. If you're feeling dry, barren, empty, weak, or sick, Bring all those parts of yourself to me. I want it all. And the scriptures we just read also invite us to pray interly. The passage from Hebrews calls us to enter the Holy of Holies in full assurance of faith, with confidence and courage, knowing that God loves us and accepts us and wants us to bring our whole selves to him in prayer. And the psalm calls us to Seek God's face earnestly. And the gospel this morning provides an example of someone praying interly by recounting the climax of a long conversation between Christ and a feisty Samaritan woman to whom we were introduced a few weeks ago during Lent, the fourth Sunday of Lent. Does anyone remember the name that church tradition has given to this feisty Samaritan woman? This is tricky. This is a while ago. <laughs> What's that? Is this a bonus round? This is a bonus round, exactly. <laughs> bonus points. Fotini. That's Fotini, which means enlightened one. Fotini boldly brought her questions and confusions to Christ, and Christ responded to Fotini with an invitation 
for her to bring even more of herself to him, even those parts of which she was ashamed. And when she did bring her whole self to him, warts and all, he lovingly revealed his divine self to her, a revelation of love, saying, I am he, the Messiah, the one speaking to you. The scriptures invite us to bring our whole selves to God in prayer, even those parts of which we might be ashamed, to pray interly as Julian prayed. Now, during Julian's lifetime, the Black Death, or the bubonic plague, was wiping out more than a third of England's population and more than half of Norwich, which was a port city, so it was especially vulnerable to the plague. And the Hundred Years' War between England and France was well underway, claiming hundreds, if not thousands, of young people's lives. And followers of the heretic and Bible translator John Wycliffe, followers who were known as Lollards, were being burned at the stake all throughout England. So climate change, famine, as well as peasant protests and peasant revolts convinced many at the time that the world was nearing its apocalyptic end. And on top of all this, the people were quickly growing disillusioned with the church and her leaders who were proving just as power-hungry and abusive as the political leaders of the day squabbling over rights of succession. There were three people who were claiming to be popes at the time. This was known as the Avignon papacy, the Babylonian captivity of the papacy. It was in this context that Julian prayed interly, which meant bringing to Christ her doubts and questions, asking God, why is there so much suffering, so much death? And God, why do you allow such disturbing people to be in positions of power. Often we ourselves can be timid or afraid of asking God such questions. But if these are our questions, then praying interly means bringing these questions to God, the way Julian did. And God responded by holding Julian lovingly in all of her questions, not giving her pat answers, but offering her images and invitations into deeper love and trust. One invitation into deeper trust repeats like a refrain throughout her visions. Numerous times, God gently reminds Julian, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Authors such as T.S. Eliot, C.S. Lewis, Annie Dillard, and Thomas Merton have found immense comfort in these words and have cited them several times in their spiritual classics. However, what I love so much about Julian is that she still is not satisfied with this. She looks out her window and sees that all is not well. So she continues to pray interly, saying, and I quote, Ah, good Lord, how could all things be well? Because of the great harm which has come through sin to your creatures. And she continues, And here I wished, so far as I dared, for some plainer explanation through which I might be at ease about this matter. Julian dares to talk back to God, telling God that his response isn't sufficient, it isn't good enough. And God, who appears to appreciate her authenticity and her commitment to pray interly, responds with more revelations of love. And God continually points her to the cross, the central image around which all of the 16 visions revolve. Yet through the visions, Julian interprets the cross very differently than previous theologians, like Anselm of Canterbury, the former Archbishop of Canterbury. He understood Christ's work on the cross as essentially paying a debt that humanity owed to God, a debt made when humanity insulted God's honor by sinning. This is based on sort of that feudal system of um, trying to respect the honor of the feudal lord and paying a debt when you dishonor the feudal lord. However, for Julian, one insight that she received in these revelations is that there is no wrath in God. She is the first theologian that we know of to have made this claim. 
She writes, quote, For I saw most truly that where our Lord appears, peace is received and wrath has no place. For I saw no kind of wrath in God. She says, I saw no wrath except on man's side. And God forgives that in us. So if there is no wrath in God, then the work of the cross is no longer about the pain of a debt to a dishonored and apparently somewhat insecure deity. Instead, the cross is God's compassionate response to our own wrath and violence, which we so often tend to project onto God. The cross instead is God's willingness to hold us with love no matter what, even if it means receiving our own wrath and violence. That is a radically new way of understanding the cross. It's not appeasing God's wrath, it's appeasing our own. And throughout her visions, Julian experiences God in many ways, in the joy of laughter, in bodily pain and sickness, and even in the wondrous process of human digestion. She experiences God as a close friend, as a lover, as a king, a kind nurse, a courteous knight, as clothing, as a castle, as a cave, as a brother, as a father, and most of all, she experiences God as a mother, as the one true mother. Although not the first Christian theologian to describe Christ as mother, Julian is the first to make the mother Christ image central to her theology, central to her understanding of God. In fact, Julian's view of motherhood is so elevated that Christ is the only one who truly embodies it, no matter how wonderful our earthly mothers might be. Julian's own mother was present to her when she was severely ill, and some scholars think that Julian herself was a mother whose husband and children died from the plague before she took her anchoritic vows. So Julian knew motherhood well, and she knew that even mothers are fallible human beings. She writes, This fair and lovely word, mother, is so sweet and so kind in itself that it cannot truly be said of anyone or to anyone except of him and to him who is the true mother of life and of all things. You cannot call anyone mother appropriately except for Christ and except for, of course, my mother, who's the perfect mother as well. (laughs) (laughs) Julian understood Christ and even the Trinity as a whole as our mother. And this understanding reminds us of how God reveals God's self to us as a mother throughout the scriptures. Jesus himself identifies as a mother when he longs to gather the children of Jerusalem together as a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings in Matthew 23. And in the Isaiah passage, which Brother Richard just read, God describes how he carries his people in his womb and how he will continue to preserve his fragile and vulnerable children because he made us and because he loves us. In another one of her visions, Julian experiences the tender love and maternal protection of God through a tiny hazelnut-sized object. She writes, God showed me something small, not bigger than a hazelnut, lying in the palm of my hand. I looked at it and thought, what can this be? And I was given this general answer. It is everything which is made. I was amazed that it could last, for I thought it was so little that it could suddenly fall into nothing. And I was answered, it lasts and always will because God loves it. And thus everything has been through the love of God, she writes. And in this little thing, I saw three properties. The first is that God made it. The second is that God loves it. The third is that God preserves it. So in a hazelnut-sized object, God shows Julian the universe and assures her of his motherly love and protection. 
On this Mother's Day, Julian of Norwich invites all of us to pray entirely, to pray entirely, wholeheartedly, with our whole selves, our physical bodies, our doubts, our questions, and our emotions. Whether we're feeling sick, or bored, or frustrated, or disappointed, we are invited to give it all to God in prayer. If we have big burning questions about the problem of suffering, or about the current presidential administration, or about the future of the church, or about challenges and difficulties in our own personal lives and families, Julian's example encourages us to bring all of that to God. Although we might not get the rational, watertight answers that we might be seeking or expecting, I promise that we will get revelations of love. As the 20th century Anglican philosopher Austin Ferrer put it, God does not give us explanations. God gives up a sum. And finally, I invite you, after receiving the Eucharist, to take a hazelnut from this bowl. You may take it as a reminder of God's revelation to Julian that all creation is held within the palm of his hand. You may also take it as an invitation to appreciate God within your body by simply eating the delicious hazelnut. And you may also take it as a reminder that our true Mother God holds all that is within us and invites us to pray interly with our whole selves. Because if our Mother God can hold the entire universe in the palm of his hand, he can certainly handle all that is within us. In the loving embrace of our true Mother God, Julian assures us that all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Amen.